Well, based on DC time, I will say uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, this Women's Veterans Task Force virtual roundtable on mental health and women veterans. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and first I want to provide the number for the Veterans Crisis Line. You can call 1-800-273-8255 and press 1 to be connected to a qualified responder. This crisis line is confidential and available 24-7. Again, that number is 1-800-273-8255 and press 1 or you can text 838-255. In March, a regularly scheduled hearing was one of the first events to be uh, postponed due to health and safety precautions related to COVID-19. We obviously look forward uh, to the time when we can again convene an in-person hearing. But until then, I'm pleased that we can all gather virtually today to conduct this roundtable with broad participation. We launched the Women's Veterans Task Force last year because the fastest growing population of veterans remain historically underserved and under-resourced, and we want to change that. It has become a common refrain that women are the most visible service members and the most invisible veterans. America's two million women veterans are some of the most resilient and impressive people you will ever meet. They have blazed trails and are continuing to break down barriers in the service of our nation. Yet when women leave the military and become veterans, more barriers remain, including to their health care. Eliminating those barriers is my top priority as chair of the Women's Veterans Task Force. Women veterans are more likely to experience multiple forms of trauma throughout their lives, before, during, and after service. These include intimate partner violence and military sexual trauma. When women veterans speak publicly to the harm they experience, sometimes they are further mistreated. As Navy veteran Lindsay Church shared in her written, her written uh, statement for minority veterans of America, she said, we are made to question our value, our abilities, our safety, and perhaps most insidiously, our sanity. As a result of their experiences, women veterans also frequently experience anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, or eating disorders. The high experiences of trauma, isolation, and associated mental health conditions raise the risk of suicide. Women are not only the fastest growing cohort of veterans, but they are more than twice as likely to die by suicide than women who have never served. Times of crisis, such as glo global pandemics, exasperate many of those challenges, including the inequities and in the system of support that had already existed. Mental health conditions are treatable. VA is the best provider in the nation for applying evidence-based practices to address mental health conditions of our women veterans. And women who are enrolled in VA access, access mental health care resources at higher rates. However, women veterans also are significantly less likely to trust the VA than their male counter counterparts. Furthermore, we can't lose sight of ongoing cultural challenges at the VA. Prior to the current public health crisis, many women veterans cho chose to delay or miss care because of sexual harassment known or perceived at VA facilities. This is unacceptable. I want to commend our VA participants who have been at the front line of using evidence-based practices to, to identify many of these challenges and proposing and implementing solutions. Thanks to their work, we have learned that at least 25% of women experience sexual and gender harassment at VA facilities, and, they, they, and there are broad differences in attitudes between men and women veterans on what constitutes harassment. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, the VA had already pioneered the use of telehealth, including as a means for women to access healthcare in a more comfortable and safe environment. 
However, barriers still exist, such as access to reliable broadband, childcare, or living with an abusive partner. Today, we will hear from VA, veteran service organizations, community organizations, and academia on how to address upstream factors to improve mental well being in women veterans, eliminate barriers, and reduce the risk of suicide. So I welcome you all and I look forward uh, to your testimony. And with that, I'd like to recognize Dr. Dunn for five minutes for any opening remarks he may wish to make. Dr. Dunn? Thank you very much, Chairwoman Brown. I'll be brief. Uh, thank you for arranging today's uh, Health uh, Subcommittee virtual forum. Uh, the Women's Veterans Task Force is, uh, is tasked with examining the impact of COVID-19 on women's, women veterans' mental health. Uh, it's important for us to examine unique ways uh, that this unprecedented pandemic uh, and quarantine has affected and will continue to affect the mental health of all of our veterans and especially our nation's female veterans. I look forward to the opportunity to hear from our panelists, and I thank you all for joining us today. I also look forward to the opportunity to work with my colleagues to identify areas of need within the VA health system and create some solutions that work for our female veterans. Each of our districts face unique uh, mental health challenges uh, from both the uh, pandemic and the quarantine, and uh, it presents many new challenges. Uh, Congress remains committed to all aspects of our nation's health during and after this crisis. It's not surprising that mental health is a major part of that operation. And with that, I yield back. Well, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Dunn. And uh, we're delighted to have the chairman of the committee, Chairman Takano, uh, joining us today. I believe he's here, um, our fearless leader. If he would like five minutes uh, to make some opening remarks, we would welcome that. Chairman Takano. Thank you, Chairwoman Brownlee. Uh, good afternoon. And I want to thank you, Chairwoman Brownlee, for holding this virtual roundtable. Uh, I know it's breaking new ground and, uh, um, and we're using technology and I thank you for uh, doing all that you have done to get this to happen. And I thank you, uh, uh, is Ranking Member Rowe with us on the phone? Um, no, he's not, I, I don't think so. All right, um, uh, well, I know that Dr. Dunn is here and I, I wanna thank um, all of our uh, Republican members uh, for uh, making uh, our virtual events truly bipartisan. Uh, and I thank you for that as well. Uh, despite virtually working virtually to ensure the safety of our witnesses, stakeholders, and staff, our committee has relentlessly worked to advocate for veterans and fulfill our oversight of VA's response to this crisis. The committee's top priority is addressing the public health crisis of veteran suicide. Earlier this year, the committee's first full committee hearing addressed VHA's work on suicide reduction and prevention. The committee has adopted the CDC's seven strategies for reducing suicide, strengthening economic supports, strengthening access and delivery of care, uh, creative, uh, creating protective environments, promoting connectedness, teach, uh, teaching coping and uh, problem solving skills, identifying and supporting people at risk, and lessening harms and preventing future risks for all veterans. Now, unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has increased uncertainty, stress, and anxiety for many veterans and has made it more challenging to ensure the needs of at-risk veterans are met. That is particularly true for women veterans who face 20% unemployment and who must rely on mental health care delivered by telehealth. Many women veterans who uh, already face a higher rate of intimate partner violence than non-veteran women are sheltering in place with abusers. Women veterans are more likely than, uh, are more than twice as likely to die by suicide than non-veteran women. However, that rate of suicide decreases for women who receive their care through VA. Through its National Center for PTSD Women's Health Sciences Division, VA pioneers research and evidence-based practice for treating PTSD in women. In order for women veterans to use VA, they must trust VA. It is unacceptable that at least one in four uh, women veterans experiences sexual and gender harassment in healthcare settings at VA. 
Eliminating this disruptive behavior requires commitment from the highest levels of leadership in collaboration with VSOs. Chairwoman Brownlee's bill, the Deborah Sampson Act, which passed the House of Representatives in November, required this key stakeholder engagement and also established requirements for clear reporting mechanisms. From the secretary on down, every individual who sets foot on VA property has a role to play in ensuring that everyone feels safe receiving care at VA facilities. Now, promoting connectedness among women veterans posed a challenge well before social distancing. Women are frequently isolated uh, while serving in the military and after leaving uh, the service. And they often struggle to find community and connection as veterans. Today, I'm looking forward to hearing from our participants about the successes and opportunities in building supportive environments for women veterans. Now, I understand that all of your organizations have lessons uh, learned that you can share with this committee and how you have successfully engaged with America's 2 million women veterans, whether they live in major cities, small towns, or on tribal lands. On March 12th of this year, on the very last day, the Capitol was open to the public. I had the opportunity to speak with women veterans who traveled to DC with an organization called Women Veterans Rock. I, I remain impressed by these women's unrelenting support for one another and, uh, and their drive to continue to serve. To the women veterans watching this roundtable, uh, watching at home, um, uh, I want you to know that you are not alone. You have the full support of this committee, the Women Veterans Task Force, the VA and VSO advocates speaking on your behalf today. Chairwoman Brownlee has already shared the number for the Veterans Crisis Clinic, but I want to take this opportunity to share it again. Call 1-800-273-8255 and press one. Again, that number is 1-800-273-8255 and press one, or you can text 838-255. Know that the crisis line is open 24 seven, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Before I, I close out, I also want to give out a second number. Uh, that number is for, I want to let, let you know that all veterans uh, during this pandemic, during this, during, during this, during this emergency, national emergency, uh, if you do not have insurance and you need to get medical care, uh, you can call 877-222-8387. That's 877-222-8387. And, and uh, the VA on a humanitarian basis is providing care uh, to veterans who may not have access to health coverage at this time. I wanna thank Chairwoman Brownlee and Ranking Member Rowe, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 Congress Member Dunn for holding this round table today and for many of our participants for taking the time to join us. Thank you all for your service and uh, thank you for your service to America's veterans. Uh, Chairwoman Brownlee, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Chairman Takano, and uh, thank you so much for um, participating and, and uh, demonstrating such strong leadership around our women veterans. Thank you for that. So today we have a broad participation in today's roundtable, which I'm uh, very, very excited about. Um, from VA, we have Dr. Patty Hayes, Chief Consultant, Office of, of Women's Health. Dr. Elizabeth Yano, Director for VA uh, Research and Development Center, Healthcare and Innovation. Dr. Susan McKetchen, National Mental Health Director, Family Services, Women's Mental Health and Military Sexual Trauma. Dr. Leanne E. Bruce, National Intimate Partner Violence Program Manager. And from our non-governmental participants, we are joined by uh, Ms. Tammy Bartlett, Associate, Associate Director of the National Legislative Service, Veterans for Foreign Wars. Ms. Maureen uh, Elis, Associate Legislative Director for Paralyzed Veterans of America. Uh, Ms. Stephanie Gattis, Chair of the Wellness Policy Committee for uh, the Military Women's Coalition. Uh, Ms. Caitlin Hetrick, Associate for Government Affairs, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Uh, Ms. Joy Elam, National Legislative Director, Disabled American Veterans. 
Ms. Jennifer Silva, CEO, Wounded, Wounded Warrior Project. And finally, Dr. Kate uh, Hendricks Thomas, uh, an author, researcher, and faculty member at the George Mason University Department of Global, uh, of global uh, Community Healthcare. So I'm pleased to have uh, everyone uh, here today and um, so grateful. Um, uh, so grateful uh, for your participation. And I would like to add that um, every single one of our witnesses um, uh, are, every single one of our non-governmental witnesses is a veteran and has honorably served our country. So thank you for your service. And so uh, because this is a virtual hearing and we have so many to participate today, um, we will uh, recognize each participant for three minutes. Um, I know it's hard to speak within three minutes. It's hard to speak within five, but if you can keep your comments uh, to three minutes, we would appreciate it. So with that, I now recognize Dr. Hayes for three minutes. Dr. Hayes. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Ranking Member Dunn, as well as Chairman Takano and um, Dr. Rowe. I'm um, very happy. We want to thank you for having us here today to discuss the support that VA is providing to our women veterans. VA implemented an aggressive public health response to COVID-19 to protect and care for veterans, their families, and healthcare staff in the face of this emerging health risk. Today, we will explain how the unique needs of women veterans are being addressed. Maintaining access to essential services such as contraception, mental health services, and intimate partner violence support and intervention is especially crucial during this time. VA has long been a leader in use of telehealth, including VA Video Connect direct to veterans' homes. This enhanced virtual care has allowed us to quickly provide continued primary care through the stay-at-home orders. The COVID-19 pandemic poses stressors and challenges for pregnant and postpartum veterans, especially for those with pre-existing traumas and mental health concerns. To address this need, VHA has developed and disseminated educational materials for women veterans and their providers. In addition, VA maternity care coordinators have proactively connected with our currently pregnant women veterans, including by mail, to assure them that we will continue to care for them during these difficult times. VHA recently launched a special six session training focused on gender related aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. This training series is designed to support women veterans' well-being, as well as the heightened self-care needs of the clinicians who are providing care to women veterans during this challenging time. Intimate partner violence is considered a major public health epidemic, and there are concerns that veterans may be at higher risk. VA has a national intimate partner violence assistance program that provides a full array of clinical and support services to promote the relationship health and safety of veterans and their partners. Because any disruption to normal life can increase the risk for individuals who are experiencing or are at risk of experiencing IPV, VA is actively addressing the needs related to COVID-19. As the pandemic continues to evolve, VA will continue to adapt and respond to the needs of women veterans. In addition to discussing our efforts for COVID-19, we would like to briefly provide you with information about other services and our efforts in women's health research. As a leader in modernizing healthcare, VA is shifting to whole health approach to care that empowers and equips our veterans to become more resilient and cope better with their day-to-day -day challenges. This approach incorporates complementary and integrative health, health coaching, and wellness-based programs into standard VA care. VHA has developed a full continuum of gender-sensitive, evidence-informed mental health services to meet women veterans' treatment needs across the reproductive lifespan and innovative clinical training efforts to strengthen mental health services for the growing population of women veterans. VA has also established a Women's Health Research Network to address knowledge gaps and improve evidence-based care for women veterans. The network is credited with significant expansion of women veterans research, including mental health, suicide prevention, and substance use, as well as gender tailored interventions to reduce disparities and improve care quality and patient experience. We thank you for the opportunity to discuss our women veterans. We are now prepared to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hayes. And I now recognize uh, Ms. Bartlett for three minutes. 
Ms. Bartlett, welcome. You may need Good to afternoon. Un- Good afternoon, Chairwoman Brownlee, uh, Ranking Member Dunn, and members of the Health Subcommittee. It's also nice to see Chairman Takano join us. On behalf of the men and women of the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States and its auxiliary, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's roundtable. The COVID pandemic adds an extra layer of mental, physical, and financial strain due to the social distancing and an increase in unemployment, depression, anxiety, and domestic violence. Recently, a VFW member, a post 9-11 woman veteran, shared her experience as a COVID-19 positive patient receiving care at VA. VA healthcare providers managed her care through telemedicine, but sadly they concerned themselves more with her physical symptoms and disregarded her mental wellness. Preliminary findings of a survey recently conducted by the VFW has shown half of routine VA and private provider appointments were moved to telehealth. Even though COVID-19 forced VA mental health programs to a virtual platform to be utilized for one-on-one appointments or group therapy, a veteran's mental health needs should not go unaddressed. Since mid-March, information on VA's new processes on how to provide gender-specific health care and services during COVID-19 had been sparse, and attempted to find the information on VA's website can be strenuous. On April 7th, VA's Health Service Research and Development Service presented a cyber seminar on reproductive health, pregnancy, intimate partner violence, mental health, and other related topics. The information remains buried deep on HSRND's webpage and is not shared on the forefront of the Center for Women Veterans and the Women Veterans Healthcare website. Communication between the Center of Women Veterans and VSOs has diminished since mid-March. The regularly scheduled first Wednesday monthly meeting with VSOs in April was rescheduled for the end of the month and then canceled. We are now in the middle of May and no further meeting is scheduled. During this COVID crisis, now is the time to overcome or over communicate and not go radio silent. The VFW requests any information on what type and how often the VA Medical Center Women Veteran Program Managers perform outreach to their women veterans in their encatchment in the past 60 days. The VFW calls on Congress to ask for veteran data from both VA and state and local health departments during the COVID pandemic. We encourage keeping women veterans in mind, but also looking at the impact of COVID-19 on other demographics and social determinants of health. The VFW encourages an extensive analysis of the overall health and well-being of veterans to drive future discussions. This concludes my statement and I'm welcome to any questions you may have. Uh, Thank you, doctor. Thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Uh, Elias for three minutes. Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Rowe, Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dunn, and members of the committee. Paralyzed Veterans of America would like to thank you for the opportunity to submit our views on the mental health of women veterans. Women veterans with spinal cord injuries or disorders, or SCID, are a small underrepresented cohort when it comes to mental health research, both in and out of the VA. And yet, As with every other veteran, they are entitled to the same care and benefits, including comprehensive, compassionate VA mental health care. Many of the mental health issues women veterans face, such as suicide, depression, and substance abuse, are present among women with SCID at higher rates than their male counterparts. During prolonged isolation periods, like the one we are in now, it is imperative that VA's healthcare providers include quality of life and somatic symptom assessments when conducting depression screenings for women veterans with SCID. Providers should also be gauging loneliness and paying attention to what social support is available to these women as they are less likely to be married, less likely to leave the home and need more support getting to work, attending medical appointments or meeting family obligations. VA healthcare providers should conduct screening for in-home violence including caregiver violence at every point of service during the pandemic. Some of our members have been forced to reduce or are unable to procure outside medical services because of the pandemic. So they are leaning on family members or friends for their care. This can contribute to the perception that they are a burden, 
which may lead to higher levels of depression and or suicidal thoughts. These women veterans will also need additional support finding employment as they are competing for jobs that now have hundreds of potential candidates in a workforce that sometimes discriminates against individuals with disabilities. Using telehealth as a method to deliver care during the pandemic seems to be working well with our members who are more susceptible to acquiring the virus and having an adverse outcome if contracted. Improving and expanding on telehealth once the national emergency is lifted will allow them to mitigate this risk while still receiving the care they need and deserve. PVA notes that VA has successfully used expedited hiring processes to bring on staff. The VHA mental health system still has thousands of critical manpower shortages. Some of these special hiring authorities should be retained to help VA fill these slots after the national emergency is over. Additionally, VA should develop national protocols on mental health inpatient care for veterans with SCID. And Congress should establish a requirement that information on VA mental health care for these veterans be tracked and reported. Thank you again for the opportunity to submit our view on the mental health and wellness of women veterans. We would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you so very, very much. And now I recognize uh, Ms. Goddess uh, for three minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dr. Dunn, Ranking Member Dr. Rowe, Chairman Takano, and to the staff who coordinated this virtual effort. We are very honored. I am Stephanie Gathas, a Navy veteran and chair of the Wellness Policy Committee for the Military Women's Coalition. I am also the CEO and founder of the Pink Berets, a Texas-based nonprofit that provides direct services to our women, uh, service women and women veterans. Our mission, duty, and purpose provides direct, I'm sorry, are to address, educate, coordinate, and provide aid and relief to active duty women of the United States Armed Forces and veterans seeking assistance with invisible injuries such as traumatic brain injuries, post-traumatic stress, and military sexual trauma. I'm going to relate a condensed story of a post-9-11 veteran who sought care through our program to demonstrate the primary problem we see with mental health treatment for women veterans. This year, a patient came to the Pink Parades with her VA th when her VA therapist moved to another agency. Our clinical psychologist, Dr. Abney, saw her for an intake interview and decided to see her weekly for individual therapy. The patient had a history of chronic suicidality. When her suicidal thoughts increased in frequency and severity, Dr. Abney sent her to the ER at the VA with her husband to be admitted. She was admitted in the inpatient's women's unit and detoxed as she had been drinking to cope. She was advised by her VA psychiatrist to enter the VA's Villa Serena Substance Abuse Program, but a work colleague worked there and she didn't feel comfortable being admitted to this program. Dr. Abney recommended Laurel Ridge Treatment Center because it had a partial hospitalization program for follow-up, which Dr. Abney believed would give her the full support that she required. Her husband took her to the Laurel Ridge Treatment Center for a marathon intake that lasted eight hours, despite having provided all of the required information previously to the VA. She became agitated and left. Her husband took her home removed all pills from the home and returned to LRTC in the morning for the intake. There was no handoff between the VA and the private program, despite the clear risk of suicide. This example demonstrates the way the patients are bounced around programs and not receiving the quality of care that is needed through these programs. Our recommendations, the VA used to have a day treatment program, which was the equivalent of Lower Ridge Treatment Center partial hospitalization program. They closed it about 15 years ago, but it has been and is still needed, especially with post 9-11 veterans and those who require transition services and more intensive care. If they need peer counselors installed, this would make the program much more appealing to veterans who are entering these types of programs. Our second recommendation is for the VA to attend the needs of patients in order to prevent suicides. There needs to be much better communication between the VA and community care. I thank you for this time and this opportunity, and then we are open for any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Goddess, and I now recognize Ms. Hetrick for three minutes. Welcome. Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dunn, Chairman Takano, and members of the subcommittee. 
On behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America's more than 425,000 members, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's roundtable. IEVA would also like to thank the Women Veterans Task Force for the valuable work they are doing to address the gaps in care for women veterans. Transitioning from the military can be extremely stressful. It is estimated that more than 30,000 women leave the military each year. The military teaches us how to work hard and efficiently, and when we walk out the gates, we are expected to understand how to function in a world that we forgot the moment we put on our boots. Fortunately, I found a job quickly after leaving the military, but this is not the case for everyone. Women veterans have higher rates of unemployment and are more likely to be homeless than their civilian counterparts. In IEVA's most recent survey, 38% of women veterans reported that they had difficulty covering expenses in a typical month. In the U.S., it is estimated that there are currently over 3,000 homeless women veterans. When asking whether their challenges are unique, the answer is generally no, but they do state that the support that they need is often hard to access. It is imperative that we expand VA housing and assistance programs for homeless and displaced women veterans and their families so that women and women with children have broad access to shelter facilities and housing solutions. COVID-19 has created an increasingly stressful environment. As a mother of a school-aged child and a toddler, the difficulty of balancing taking care of my children and ensuring that I am satisfying my professional responsibilities has been a learning curve. I am fortunate enough to work for an organization that has allowed me to work from home for the past two months, enabling me to ensure my children are safe and cared for. But not, again, not everyone has this opportunity. We have to acknowledge that those that may have been forced to leave their jobs due to the inability to find childcare. Approximately 12% of military women are single mothers. A few years after getting out of the military, my husband and I separated. I moved back home to Ohio and my children's father stayed behind. I would have never graduated or been able to hold a job without the help of my family. Not every single parent has this luxury and sometimes the lack of having childcare can have severe consequences. The closure of daycare facilities during the pandemic is currently unavoidable, but it can be a barrier to receiving necessary transition and healthcare services from VA. This is why expanding childcare services at all VA facilities and local in local communities should be a top priority. Ensuring, ensuring that a lack of childcare does not prevent veterans from seeking care or finding meaningful employment. Finally, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has created se severe hardships for Americans and communities across the country. Due to complex systems, our nation's veterans are in critical need of tailored support in this time of crisis. To meet these challenges, IVA has accelerated the relaunch of our comprehensive care management program, the Quick Reaction Force, to effectively meet the needs of our community. Since March, QRF has seen a 67% increase in veterans reaching out in desperate need of help for things like emergency financial assistance, employment, and housing. 32% of those inquiries have come from women veterans. Women veterans are becoming more prominent in American culture and are stepping up and leading. Their contributions and sacrifices are becoming better known and recognized. Still, every day women veterans enter into VA facilities nationwide and are not recognized for their service. Until women veterans are as known and understood as their male counterparts, IVA's work will not be done. Members of the subcommittee, thank you again for the opportunity to share our views on these issues today. I look forward to working with the subcommittee in the future. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Hetrick. And now I recognize Ms. Elam for three minutes. Thank you. Chairman Ticano, Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dunn, members of the subcommittee and Women Veterans Task Force. Thank you for inviting DAV to participate in this roundtable focused on understanding the mental health needs of women veterans and improving programs and services to better meet their unique needs. VA research indicates that some women veterans experience reintegration issues after leaving military service that can negatively impact their overall health, mental well being, and hamper a successful transition from military service. Higher rates of service connection among women using VA and increased use of mental health services are reflective of the challenges many women veterans face. Concerning trends identified among this population include higher rates of suicide compared to their non-veteran peers, increased risk for poverty, homelessness, military sexual trauma, eating disorders, and intimate partner violence. Sexual or combat related trauma can have lasting impacts on physical and mental health resulting in post-traumatic stress, anxiety, and or depression, and other chronic health conditions. The effects of these conditions may be compounded if comorbid with, co with substance use disorder or traumatic brain injuries. Given women veterans minority status within VA healthcare system and higher use of community care among this population, specialized and coordinated services are necessary to ensure they have access to appropriate care 
effective treatment programs, and gender sensitive support services. Coordination of community care services is essential to maintain the benefits of VA's whole health model of care. During this public health crisis, VA must make an even greater effort to provide outreach and track veterans that are at higher risk for poor health outcomes. Women veteran care coordinators are essential and should conduct routine outreach to women veterans during the pandemic to track emerging trends related to loss of employment, housing instability, food insecurity, and increased needs for mental health and gender specific services. We encourage VA to ensure women veterans receive information specifically about the National Domestic Violence Hotline, Safe Health Line, Crisis Line, and the Women Veterans Call Center to support coping skills and resiliency in this population during this challenging period. In closing, we applaud VA's continued efforts to improve and refine mental health services for our nation's women veterans and appreciate the subcommittee's attention to this important issue. Madam Chairwoman, this concludes my statement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Elam. And I now recognize Ms. Silva for three minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dr. Dunn, Chairman Takano, and members of the Women Veterans Task Force. Thank you for holding this important forum and providing me the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, as an Army veteran and today as the Chief Program Officer of Wounded Warrior Project, I'm grateful for the responsibility of delivering direct programs to over 140,000 wounded, injured, or ill post 9-11 veterans, and nearly 23,000 of those are women. In 2019 alone, we provided mental health support to more than 1,200 women through three programs that form our mental health continuum of support. Warrior Care Network, which provides intensive outpatient therapy. Project Odyssey, which helps veterans overcome post-traumatic stress through outdoor resiliency retreats. And Wounded Warrior Project Talk, our mental health support line. These programs are described in detail in my written statement. Like the rest of the world, Wounded Warrior Project has had to adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic. On March 16th, we began pivoting the delivery of our programs and services from in-person to virtual. Since then, over 1,700 women warriors have benefited from virtual connection events and peer support group meetings. Women are participating at a disproportionately higher rate, so it's suggesting that they are eager to seek out social support during a time defined by isolation. We are also continuing our Women Veterans Initiative, Wounded Warrior Project's effort to connect women warriors and generate actionable solutions to their most challenging or pressing challenges. In January 2020, we conducted a targeted survey of women warriors to learn more about their military and civilian experiences, mental health, economic security, relationships, and much more. Nearly 5,000 women veterans responded. I'm excited to announce that next week we will begin holding virtual roundtable discussions with diverse group of women around the nation to dig deeper into the issues that that survey illuminated. In collaboration with the women we serve, our VSO partners and you, the members of the Women Veterans Task Force, we aim to identify practical solutions while empowering women warriors to become their own best advocates. I look forward to briefing you on those findings. In order to improve mental health services for women veterans and reduce barriers to care, Wounded Warrior Project recommends that the task force seek out ways to extend operating hours at VA medical facilities, support programs and services that provide compassionate, comprehensive care to survivors of military sexual trauma, authorize VA to facilitate child care for veterans attending health care appointments and urge VA to pursue a community grant program to connect women veterans with clinical and non-clinical services in their communities. As more and more women are volunteering to serve in our nation's military, these recommendations will help VA adapt to meet their unique needs. It's been my great honor to speak with you today and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Silva. Now, I now recognize Dr. Thomas for three minutes. Thank you to this committee for the important work that you are doing. It is an honor to testify in front of you. My name is Kate Hendricks Thomas, and I sit here today as a public health professional whose research focuses on the mental well being of military women. I'll share a little bit of research and maybe a one or two statistics with you in this testimony. But the truth is that a great deal of my work is informed by my own experiences and stumbles as a woman veteran. 
Long before I became an academic, I was a Marine Corps military police officer. I served in garrison and overseas, and I loved the Marine Corps. Leaving the service was incredibly tough. I would later learn that my personal challenges connecting to civilian colleagues, navigating a troubled military marriage, and reconciling my own unresolved feelings about experiences overseas were textbook. They were actually uninteresting. What I lacked at that crucial time was what many women veterans do as they make the transition from service member to civilian, social support. That lack impacted my personal resilience. Resiliency has been extensively studied and we know that key traits make a person more resilient with high levels of social support providing the foundation for a resilient life. One important place veterans are supposed to be able to build social support is within the network of veteran service organizations and military service organizations, the VSOs, MSOs. However, my research has shown that we have room for improvement in this sector when it comes to reaching women veterans, even before the pandemic. A 2017 study we published in Traumatology found direct links between experiences on active duty and concerns post-service. A third of women veteran respondents reported having poor connections with a community of fellow vets. Another study examined participation by women veterans in VSOs and MSOs. Only a quarter of respondents in that study were involved with these groups. Qualitative analyses indicated that respondents reported feeling unwelcome and or felt like the group's missions lacked relevance to them. And it's here we find prime space to improve outreach and inclusion. VSO and MSO programming should consider gender-based norms and recognize that barriers to women veterans' participation in their organizations may in fact exist. Culturally competent programming could include offerings in a single sex environment that offer a bridge into larger group participation. Gender norms in military family life should be considered. There is a mandate for change, recognition, and inclusion in the transition environment. Women veterans must not remain invisible during this crucial time. Any statistic represents a real woman who stepped up to serve and then left that service to find that much of the social capital and the network of resources that are supposed to be available for veterans was just a little bit less available and welcoming for her. The work of this task force and your committee is a welcome intervention. Consider me grateful to speak with you and to support your efforts in the future in any way that I can. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And I wanna thank uh, everybody for their uh, testimony. It's so nice to see uh, so many strong women who care very, very deeply about the welfare of our women veterans. So uh, thank you for that. And I'm now gonna recognize myself uh, for five minutes um, of questioning. and. Uh, my first question really is to uh, Dr. Hayes and Dr. Yano, and um, uh, the VA did a study in a 2019 study on um, gender differences uh, in veterans' per, uh, perception of stranger harassment uh, at, at v, at, on VHA grounds uh, that, that men uh, downplayed harassment as sort of harmless flirting. So uh, two, really two questions. Um, one, uh, probably for more for Dr. Hayes is, uh, what work has VA done to compare um, this kind of behavior that was discovered through this uh, study, um, to compare this kind of behavior uh, in the VA healthcare system uh, compared to other healthcare uh, settings outside of VA, and then, I think for Dr. Yano, if you could really speak to um, what research is taking place regarding the impact um, of stranger harassment at VA on women veterans' uh, mental health. So Dr. Hayes? Thank you for the question. And it is really critically important that we make our facilities a site where women veterans and all veterans feel comfortable, welcome, safe, and secure and that the site and the behavior of other veterans doesn't interfere with their access to healthcare. So we've been uh, attacking this issue, as you know, uh, not only about gender harassment, but all harassment in a major campaign that we've had underway for uh, a number of years. We've been very concerned, and Dr. Yana will be able to outline uh, some of the research results that do show us what we had long heard, which is that 
women veterans in particular are subjected to sex and gender-based harassment on their visits to VA hospitals. It's been difficult to um, assess non-VA sites, and frankly, we have to fix VA. Uh, we do know that there is a kind of carryover of the military culture, and as we hear from our veterans who are talking about the transition and the differences between military culture and uh, VA and veteran culture, that sometimes that same kind of barracks mentality seems to carry over. And our women are telling us that that's what they experience, that male veterans may see some of the things that they're doing as somehow not harmful. A significant part of our uh, teaching of veterans about harassment has been to make it clear to male veterans that um, controlling behavior, harassing behavior is very harmful. Uh, they tell us actually in focus groups that it's been influential to them to hear that their behaviors are interfering with women coming to the VA for care. So we've been, we've been highlighting those kinds of messages with our male veterans. We think it's important for all of our veterans to be involved in this effort. The other angle that we've taken on this um, has been to engaging the VSOs, and we're very early at that effort to have the VSOs be part of our campaigns to end harassment in the VA. Uh, we do know that there are some other social media um, and other social sites, some healthcare systems. We've been looking at some data, even uh, one of our researchers has been in uh, Toronto and um, looking at some of the things that other systems are doing. We really haven't seen other systems with quite the challenge that VA has in terms of this culture of accepting, um, smiling, controlling, leering, commenting behaviors. Another thing that we've done is looking at the environment of care. We want to make sure that the environment is welcoming and that the environment prevents harassment. And we uh, have a couple of efforts that have been very helpful. One is inviting our veteran, our veteran women employees and our women veterans to walk the environment with the hospital director and the hospital interior designer, point out the, the situations and sites that are unwelcoming or unsafe and work very quickly to change those kinds of sites at the VA and to invest in um, the monies that we had in plus up to change these environment to enhance the security and privacy for women veterans. With that, I'll yield the time in order that uh, Dr. Yano can answer that section. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for pointing out these issues that we've revealed in our research on the prevalence of harassment uh, among women veterans uh, by male veterans. Um, part of your question was on the impacts of stranger harassment on women veterans' mental health. And we definitely found that our women veterans with military sexual trauma histories um, were particularly triggered by some of these behaviors uh, while on their way to see their doctor. And that's a particular concern and ensuring that the kinds of environmental walkthroughs and checklists that we've developed are used uniformly across VA facilities so that people can take the women veterans voice and experience into mind as they lay out different clinical environments. Um, we do have a, a study that has been uh, slowed a little bit by the COVID um, crisis uh, that has been conducting inter interviews of subject matter experts inside and outside the VA uh, in terms of stranger and public harassment. Uh, the next step is to conduct public deliberation uh, um, groups to develop novel interventions, because what the experts are saying outside the VA is there are no easy evidence-based solutions to these kinds of complex culture change uh, needs. And that group will shift from in-person, which we can't do currently, to a, a virtual forum and will be done in the next couple of months. There's also a new study that just got funded on a bystander activation intervention that's going to use uh, photos uh, done by women veterans themselves in different VA facilities to better visually uh, represent their experiences of harassment uh, to then change the, uh, the not just willingness, but the comfort in having people intervene, having veterans intervene for each other, having staff and leaders intervene whenever they, they witness any of this kind of behavior. So that study will be starting soon. We have another proposal also going in to actually do site visits in VAs with high and low harassment rates to better understand the experiences in different regions and different contexts in the VA. Um, and to make sure that we understand the context in urban and rural settings 
and to get on the ground to really dive deep with women veterans, men veterans, understand what's driving behavior so that we can better design interventions that frankly will be novel outside the VA as well. Um, but as Dr. Hayes said, we need to fix it in the VA first. Uh, Dr. Yana, we're, we've extended on the time, but I, I, it's, I, I feel like it's important to really hear what the VA is doing, but I want to uh, try to be equitable here, and we have gone over our time, so uh, thank you for that, and I, I just, uh, uh, before I call on Dr. Dunn, I just want to say to um, uh, Dr. Hayes is, I really remember one of the first uh, women's uh, veteran task force meetings we had with you, um, and remember sort of revealing this issue of really the VA doesn't have a firm uh, policy or guidance around um, uh, uh, you know, harassment, uh, stranger harassment, I think we're calling it now, but that kind of harassment that takes place uh, at VA. And we hence put together a bill and that bill went into the Deborah Sampson Act. But I, I think, uh, you know, it's all the educational pieces are really important um, and being, you know, keenly uh, focused on this by facility by facility. But I think we also need to have, uh, you know, very clear uh, guidance, uh, particularly in creating an environment where, where you, if you see something, say something, and um, so that we can really go after this. So uh, I thank you both uh, for being here and, um, I will now uh, recognize uh, Dr. Dunn uh, for five minutes for questions. Dr. Dunn. Thank you very much, Chairwoman. And I also want to say I'm grateful to the, uh, to the VSOs for stepping up even more than they normally do to support our veterans uh, you know, back home during this, uh, this time of uh, crisis. Uh, I do wish we could be meeting in person like Dr. Rowe. I think that it's a lot easier to uh, legislate and provide oversight and actually the normal give and take of uh, of uh, conversation and conferring uh, ideas uh, if we're in person. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I would also note that uh, there are members who live in very rural districts uh, uh, that could not participate in this, this meeting. General Bergman was uh, was disappointed that uh, he lacked the connectivity to, to join us today. So I just want to pass that thought on. Dr. Hayes, what metrics is the VA using to monitor access to and demand for mental mental health care during the current uh, pandemic quarantine? And, and what have those metrics shown from March until now? Thank you. We are looking at all of our metrics. I have to say it's fairly early for us to have a sense of all of the metrics that we will be uh, able to look at. And I will let Dr. McCutcheon have a moment about this as well, but um, we actually have been concerned about being able to make sure we stay in touch with our veterans. And so we've been triaging, having the providers look at their own panels and reaching out to veterans directly so that uh, it's not a question of waiting for the veteran to contact us to get the help they need. But with regard to the mental health use, I'd like to have Dr. McCutcheon uh, speak to the issues around mental health access in the pandemic. Please do. You're muted. Well, that's the first step, isn't it? To get unmuted. Um, okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that almost never happens when we're in person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. Hayes, thank you. Um, as Dr. Hayes mentioned, it's still early as far as getting some statistics, but one thing I do want to talk about is, as many people have alluded to, that with the um, COVID pandemic, there was this immediate shift to um, rapidly go to virtual care. And I do have some statistics around that, that in April of 2020, there were 1.2 million um, telephone and televisits, video visits, which is really 80% of the total. And when you look at five months prior to the, um, to the virus, the um, mental health providers averaged 169,000 telephone outreach calls a month. In March, it was 464,000. In April, 973,000. So what we're seeing is a rapid increase of this virtual format to um, provide our mental health connection. And I know a lot of folks are interested also in the group format. And five months prior, there was only 146 VA video connect group psych psychotherapy connections 
in March in comparison to the 146 was 4,000 and in April 33,000. So what we're seeing is that during this rapid shift to virtual, we're really gearing up and doing many, many more mental health visits in this type of platform. And so, you know, you know, in a sense, I'm a doctor, by the way. So in, in a sense, uh, you know, we've been doing uh, telemedicine for decades. You know, I'm calling people and they call me in the middle of the night <laughs> and uh, certainly uh, that way. But but I will say that I think that it's uh, it's not the same quality of interaction um, uh, still. Now, there may, we may get to that point someday when it's artificial reality and whatnot. But uh, at this point, it's it still feels a little difficult and, and uh, Certainly, we've had some troubles here in our district at getting mental health. So truly suicidal veterans presenting to, you know, the clinics, the CBOX, and trying to get them hospitalized. And um, and actually, Dr. Stone interviewing himself personally for me one day uh, uh, to get a guy uh, admitted uh, who was literally sitting there in the CBOX suicidal. So, I, you know, I would, I would speak to the value of uh, still seeing each other. Uh, we have about 30 seconds left. Um, I just think I'll yield back instead of trying to get somebody to jam an answer to a question but, like that. Uh, I'll just, Thank you very much. Go yeah, ahead. Dr. Dunn, if I may make a quick point, that I think there is some pros and cons. We do find that there are many veterans who do prefer this format. Certainly when it looks at, you know, drive time and other stresses that. that uh, yeah. And also, you know, I think, especially with our, our veterans who've experienced MST, if the choice is between a virtual visit where I can see your face versus me being in a mask and <laughs> I can see your face. And, you know, our, our veterans who have experienced this do get claustrophobic, you know, with masks on. And they really so rely on your personal expressions so we're having a virtual visit where I can see you and I can see your reaction may be a preferred method than if I was covered up and I was not feeling well because I'm feeling like that may be reminiscent of that experience of being claustrophobic. So I, I think you know individualized care is so important. We want to do what's best for the person, best for our veterans. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I, I'm always having trouble with the lights in my office. It looks like it's glary to me. I yield back, uh, Chairwoman Brown, Brownlee. Thank, Thank you, so Dr. Dunn. And I think that point about the masks um, is a very valid one, uh, given this time that I had, I personally hadn't even thought of. So it's a, an important point. So our chairman is with us, um, and we're delighted to have him here and appreciative um, uh, of having him here. And so I will recognize Chairman Takano for five minutes of questioning. Thank you for that, Chairwoman Brownlee. Um, my first question is for Ms. Silva, Wounded Warrior Project. I've heard that women's participation in the Wounded Warrior Project's virtual programming has significantly increased during the COVID-19 lockdowns, uh, that the women's participation in these programs, this programming. Uh, do you have an explanation for why that is? Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, so we're really excited about what we've learned with these virtual programming. I mean, they're so they're about 17% of our overall population, but they're actually programming and they're they're engaging with us during this COVID time at about a 44% rate of all of our programs. And and so what they've told us is you know, it's a a lot easier to just get on a, um, a platform and get into maybe another room as opposed to drive time and getting childcare for even our own programs, um, not just medical appointments. And so it's just an, a lower barrier um, or lower obstacle. Um, you know, you, there are some things that um, are missed when it's not face to face, but because it's just a little bit easier to join a workout, to join a peer support group, to join telehealth. I mean, we're, we're offering that as well. It's, it's really engaging them at a level that we hadn't seen as much. It was about a 23% rate before. And so it's double that. Uh, so there's some real goodness in this um, virtual world. I, I think we'll see how it goes as different areas open up and people get outside if that still continues. But um, it's it's that they don't have to coordinate their whole life around it. It's just much easier. Well, very quickly, Ms. Silva, um, uh, has this kind of affected maybe the way you guys are planning long-term? Uh, 
Yes, we are. We're, we're looking at offering um, maybe up to a quarter of our programs virtually now. So to target populations that are, are kind of over engaging right now. So that would be women veterans, maybe veterans in rural areas, whatever we can do. So we're, we're changing the way we're, we're going to program going into the next uh, year. Wonderful. Well, that's interesting. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Thank you. Bruce, Dr. Bruce of the VA, um, I have a couple of questions related to intimate partner violence. Um, has VA uh, tracked significant changes in demand for intimate uh, partner violence resources or IPV resources since March? Actually, uh, thank you for that question and thank you for this opportunity to speak today um, and tell you a little bit more about our program. We are a national program. Um, with coordinators out in the field. And um, from what we're seeing, I think it, as uh, Dr. Hayes mentioned, it's still a little bit early. We're not necessarily seeing an uptick in uh, reaching out to our coordinators um, from the, the virus. What we're trying to do now is really focus on getting information um, out to our veterans that we know are in their homes and on lockdown and so forth in a variety of, of ways. Um, we have a memorandum of agreement you mentioned earlier, um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, we know that sometimes they might not call us or might not be able to call us, but in, in some privacy, they can connect <clears throat> with the National Domestic Violence Hotline. And we have a memorandum of agreement with them and they're a really strong partner of ours so that we can make sure that we are putting that out there for 24 seven care so that they might have a few minutes of privacy that they can make contact if they're needing that um, or needing some guidance on safety. So Dr. Bruce, when you say it's kind of early, you're telling me that you really don't have enough time or statistics to say whether there's been an uptick in demand for uh, IPV resources or whether there's a lower demand uh, that could be explained by uh, that, that there's not enough access. So you, you, there's not enough really, there's not enough data to tell you. Right. Way. There's not enough data. And, you know, we're seeing on a national level that there is um, some lower reporting of, of abusive behaviors. And, and, you know, of course, we know that some of these things are, it's not that it's not happening. It's that a lot of times people might not have the ability to make those phone calls and have the privacy to make those phone calls. So that, that certainly is something that's concerning. And what we're trying to do is be proactive to get information to them so that they can um, to reach out when they can for needs and so forth and get resources in their hands, like through our public facing website, um, information on safety planning, the 24 seven uh, hotline numbers and so forth. Well, we'll, we'll certainly, uh, my time is about to run out, but we're certainly interested uh, uh, on the committee level uh, to know when you're able to give us meaningful uh, reports on the data. I yield back, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairman Takano, and I now recognize uh, uh, Mr. Bill Rockets for five minutes of questioning. Are you with us, Mr. Bill Rockets? Not hearing Mr. Bill Rockets, so I'll go to Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb? I'm here. Hi. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome. Hey, thank you everybody for all this. And uh, Dr. Hayes, I think I'm only probably about 15 miles or less away from you right now. Um, I heard you say Monroeville. So uh, my question is actually for you. I appreciate you highlighting the uh, whole health program, which I think has a lot of promise going forward and can help a lot of our different groups of veterans, but especially women. And I was just kind of curious if you could give us a little more detail on the way that whole health has been sustained during the coronavirus pandemic and how how it's been these programs have been able to reach women veterans maybe outside of their normal hospital or clinic or anything we can do to support continuing to strengthen that program in this new world that we're in certainly thank you uh, for that interest in the whole health programs i think the va is unique in uh, adding as many whole health integrative health uh, opportunities for our veterans and seeing the veteran as a whole person with a focus on how veterans want to build their resiliency and their recoveries. And just to make it a little broader for the everyone, the whole health includes of complementary health, yoga, in, in different kinds of artistic and musical uh, opportunities, as well as chiropractic 
uh, and much of our peer support, uh, which is part of the um, integrated whole health part of what we do. The uh, women veterans have had a tremendous uptake of whole health and compared to men, and many women also uh, engage in more than one of those whole health opportunities. During the uh, pandemic, our Office of Whole Health has really uh, initiated quite a number of group opportunities. They are focused on everyone's health and resilience. So the kinds of things that are available um, for veterans are also available for staff. We have um, worked together. I know that the PTSD group, there's a, a wonderful app called COVID Coach that's available to the veterans and the public. And it has significant elements within that, including mindfulness. And it, it has alarms which allow you to kind of stop and make sure you're taking a deep breath. And it also has a number of other access points for veterans and everything from food to unemployment. So the COVID Coach app is an effective part of this kind of overall sense of uh, the whole person. The uh, office has also done a number of different social media outlet um, in the VA social media and Facebook. They're continuing to link veterans together. Uh, many uh, new opportunities now to, to do some of those groups like yoga groups. We're just getting to the point of being able to do those via uh, telehealth and teleconnect. Uh, so that, but veterans are uptaking the things that we offer, many for the reasons that women here were saying that if you can put your baby down for a nap and go ahead and go on one of these um, telehealth opportunities or the app opportunities, it, it's seen as a more significant way to, to get the help you need. Thank you. Um, do any of our, our other panelists have any recent experience with whole health and ways that are is, or, is or is not succeeding or contributing here or Idea. I mean, one of the things we've been involved in in the last year is trying to just sort of get a catalog and good data set on all the things that are happening under the umbrella of whole health so we know where to increase investment. This is Joy Elam from DAV. Um, we are really pleased about um, VA's offerings with regard to complementary and alternative medicine. Um, but the one downfall that we do see is it's not consistent throughout the system and at all locations. So. Um, I think that's something we've been calling for is, you know, to really try to get a handle. We know this is popular among um, many veterans. They want the opportunity to use it. So just making sure that the access is there based on the, um, you know, those who want to. I agree. Thank you for highlighting that. We even have examples of that locally where we have some of the best physical space for whole health programs is located in the VA facilities that are furthest away. So sometimes it's just a, I think it's been kind of luck of the draw in the early days and our, our goal is going to be to expand it and establish some quality control uh, so that everybody has access to it and, you know, we can double down on things that are succeeding. So thank you all for being part of this and uh, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back, I suppose. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lamb, and, and thank you for your sustained leadership around whole health. Every time you uh, inquire uh, during our various meetings, I always learn something new. So uh, I appreciate it and convinced it's a really uh, very positive program and hopefully we can get it uh, consistently throughout the entire uh, entire organization. So Ms. Uh, Rodenwagen, um, I should have called on you but previously and I didn't, so please accept my apologies and um, uh, I now recognize you for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman Brownlee, Talofa, and good afternoon. And before I get to my question, I, I do want to thank HVAC leadership for making the bipartisan effort to continue committee business during this quarantine. Hopefully we can work together to better organize and eventually formalize these digital meetings or find an alternative with input from both sides of the aisle. There's a learning curve to all of this, but I hope the Veterans Affairs Committee will continue to serve as a good example of bipartisan conduct to the rest of Congress. My question is for whomever on the panel would like to answer. Women veterans express lower levels of trust in the VA healthcare system than men. Why do you think that is? And what would you recommend VA do to increase women veteran trust in VA? And does VA measure trust score for types of care? And if so, how does women's trust in mental health 
compared to men's within VA. I think that would uh, be good for Dr. Hayes. Hello, thank you for the question about trust. We have been tracking veterans trust uh, for a number of years now. Uh, they answer questions after their appointments and or their interactions with pharmacy and other appointments so that yes, we can get back with you from for the record about the exact trust scores for mental health um, by location even um, across the country data that we have. We have a number of scores that kind of fall together. One is on comfort and respect, one is on trust. And what we find is that overall younger veterans rate the VA lower um, and women slightly lower than men, but overall actually older veterans have high trust and younger veterans have lower trust. And trust is a difficult cultural thing to actually pin down uh, related to many things, including um, as we've been talking about these issues of harassment. Um, we have tried to stop all harassment and, and certainly as in places where the comfort and respect go up, the trust goes up. Um, the other things that relate to trust, uh, particularly for women veterans, are their belief that VA has the right kind of care and services for you, that uh, we are able to meet your needs, that we went from uh, surveys we did a couple years ago where women veterans, if they'd never used VA, thought that VA couldn't possibly have the care that they needed. So now if they come to VA and they have a women's health provider who gives them excellent women's health, comprehensive health, we find that their trust scores are higher, their satisfaction and their care is higher. And not only that, they are twice as likely to stay in VA care, which I think is another measure of trust. Um, I think that that answers really the parts that I'm most familiar with about our trust scores, but I think you asked specifically about mental health experiences for women. So I think if Dr. McCutcheon wanted to address that. Dr. McCutcheon, oh. I'm running out yeah. of time, but please, we, we would love to get your perspective. Oh, okay. One thing, um, I don't have some of the, the data that Dr. Hayes has, but what I will say is when you look at our veterans who've experienced military sexual trauma and those that have screened positive, the numbers, the percent that then go on to get a treatment referral that seek and um, connect and engage in MST related treatment has just increased tremendously over the years. So we're finding that more and more as, as Dr. Hayes talked about, that they're trusting that we have care that is suited for them. And also what Dr. Hayes is saying is now we have an infrastructure within women's mental health where we now have a women's mental health champion at every site. And the idea that we're trying to really educate our clinicians so much more on the nuances of women's mental health, that then our women veterans can come to the VA and have confidence that they're going to be looked after by competent clinicians who understand and also um, understand not only the sensitivities of taking care of women veterans, but also some of the gender specific issues related to prescribing practices. Uh, around their reproductive mental health. And these things are very important. So that's an uh, excellent question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairwoman Browning. I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you so much. And um, I now call in Mr. Levin. Well, thank you, Chair Brownlee. I appreciate you uh, bringing us together uh, for an important discussion. Thank you for uh, bringing together uh, these great witnesses, and I thank everyone for their expertise and your testimony and for all that you're doing. Uh, I just wanted to follow up briefly, just had a few questions. Uh, Dr. Hayes, uh, I have heard that about one in three essential workers are women, uh, which means it's highly likely that uh, many women veterans are on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what is the VA hearing from women veterans about their experiences as essential workers during the pandemic? I have to say, I actually don't have that kind of communication link um, to women veterans outside the VA, or uh, in, I really can't answer your question. I'm sorry. No problem. Perhaps uh, any of uh, our other uh, guests, they have any perspective to share on that? Um, I actually have a, a classmate who uh, 
was an, uh, basically a trauma doctor, an ER doctor, active duty for um, over 20 years. And she is in charge of one of the hospitals up in New York, activated a, a lot of veterans to serve in that. And I think the overwhelming feeling is that uh, usefulness and, and being really part of the national effort, It's it's been an inspiring feeling that I've heard from uh, her and other veterans. So um, all positive uh, from what I've heard. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, in Ms. Bartlett's testimony, she shared the story of a woman veteran who received treatment for COVID-19 uh, at VA, but was not asked about her mental health. Uh, Dr. McCutcheon, how is VA integrating mental health into treatment for COVID-19? Um, you know, uh, and I, um, Dr. Bro, I'm, I'm sorry to hear um, you tell share that information with me. I, it would be baffling to me on how an individual would come into a VA system and not be assessed. We have uh, universal screenings for such things as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, military sexual trauma. So um, the fact that um, they were not screened or asked or even if this person, as I think Dr. Bartlett was, was uh, suggesting that perhaps that they did have some mental health issues, that they did not get a referral. Um, I, I'm i sorry to hear that. I, I really don't have a good explanation for that because there are um, systems in place that they should have been screened. Okay. Um, this is for anybody, uh, perhaps our VSOs, um, you know, we uh, in our economic opportunity subcommittee, we've been making pretty good progress with regard to uh, women veteran homelessness, although uh, not as uh, good a progress as I would have liked. Uh, then the pandemic hit, and it seems to me that we've been set back greatly. Uh, homelessness in general, uh, I, I, uh, I know that uh, the numbers are, are dramatic. Um, but uh, particularly uh, in the veteran community and even more specifically in the women veteran community. Uh, and of course that greatly impacts mental health, um, housing issues, homelessness issues. Um, does anybody have maybe in the VSO from the VSOs, any specific suggestions for us as, as uh, members of the committee, as we try to address the related issues of uh, women veteran homelessness and mental health? This is, this is Tammy Barlett. Go ahead. Oh, why don't you go ahead and both go? We have a minute, <laughs> minute ten, so we're good. This is Terry Barley from the VFW. Um, a suggestion that the VFW has is to support the women veteran peer support specialists. Um, it, that gives uh, women veterans the trust and understanding of having another woman veteran that may have been through that same situation that they're now facing with the hardship. And we've seen in past surveys that 63% of women veterans who receive mental health care through the VA. So that's a perfect opportunity to have that connection. And I know um, the, the Senate version of the Scott Hannon um, does mention women veteran peer specialists to talk about some of their duties and responsibilities. So I think better defining that and what's um, asked of those peer specialists and those managers of them uh, can bridge that gap. And I would just add to that, um, I think having a special outreach right now to women veterans from VA's um, care coordinators or women's health program managers would be excellent, making sure that they are they are asking about housing instability, you know, employment loss, since we know that's happening to so many people and um, especially women veterans. So just kind of taking that extra step would be great. Thank you. Got the buzzer from Rashida. Thank you, I'll yield back. Thank you both for those suggestions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Levin. And I understand Dr. Rowe is online. So uh, Dr. Rowe, um, I recognize you for questioning. I got to unmute, <laughs> Julia, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I'm late. I've been on top of the third highest mountain in, in the Eastern part of the United States with the vice president's wife open up the Great Smoky Mountain National Park in a driving rainstorm. So it's been wonderful. I wanna thank you. <laughs> I'm off the mountain, it's dry now. So thank you, listen, I've been listening in uh, for the last little bit, very informative. One of the things that was just said that I could not agree with more, um, and I think you find that whether it's um, the peer-to-peer -peer support 
And and as Connor was as a uh, Congressman Lamb was talking uh, about that, I th- I think having someone that you can relate to as peer to peer is incredibly important. And as I think back to my time in the Second Infantry Division uh, in Korea in 1973 and 74, I don't recall a single female. And you all in in the Second Infantry Division. I don't. I'm trying to remember at the one two one evac hospital in Seoul. There were there were nurses. But I don't remember any of the soldiers being uh, female. That has changed dramatically, and the VA is 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 making that change, albeit sometimes slower than we would like. VA hospitals, and you all have heard me say this for years, were set up for men, and they're they were arranged that way medically. That's the staff was arranged that way. It, it is slowly changing and and i think changing for the better and some vas have done an exceptional job I, as uh as a congresswoman brownlee has done and others have visited many vas around the country and so many of them have just done a great job in their women's centers but not nearly enough has been done so i think the peer-to-peer support people i don't know who said that but that that is spot on as far as i'm concerned and i really don't uh, have any questions. I just want to thank you all for having this uh, forum today, and and um, and we'll be open to any comments. Uh, thanks very much for recognizing me. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Rowe. We appreciate you uh, listening in and and multitasking. So thank you, thank you so much for that. And I will now call on Miss Luria for uh, five minutes of questioning. Well, uh, thank you, Chairwoman Brownlee and, and Dr. Dunn uh, for um, organizing this event and all of the witnesses for joining us today to, to talk about this very important topic, which is obviously uh, close to home for me uh, as being a, a woman veteran myself and having served uh, in the Navy for 20 years. And I wanted to follow up. A, a couple of my colleagues have just mentioned the, the female peer support specialist, and that's actually um, a, a question that, that, that I had on my mind as well. And um, the most recent data that I could find, I found that about 18% of the peer support specialists, um, this is data from 2017, um, are currently women, um, but their distribution is not managed um, to my understanding. So that they might be grouped or concentrated more in some areas and and not available at all in others or other VA facilities. Um, Here at the Hampton VA, for example, there are 10 peer support specialists, four of them are women. And in an area like this, we, I think we have more than double the percentage of, of female veterans of other areas of the country. Um, it's a great resource to have uh, a significant percentage of our, our peer support specialists as women. Um, but I was curious for the VA, um, is there any effort uh, to make sure that those peer support specialists, women um, uh, are available um, you know, more broadly or, or at all VA facilities to support our female veteran population? Sure, this is Patty Hayes. I'm unclear who should answer because um, I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding. The peer support specialists are only mental health peer support specialists, and um, there were a lot of restrictions in the original um, designation, uh, and so there's some complications to this. We have been enhancing the uh, sort of assignment uh, to women's clinics of that mental health support, and uh, it is one of the gaps that we identify across the country in terms of not having enough women's peer supports, not having enough of the peer supports. So, um, but I do ask Dr. McCutcheon if you had something that you wanted to add about um, the peer support program. You know, Dr. Hayes, I, I would of course agree with everything you said and certainly with the, the members of Congress, um, peer supports are, are critical. They're very important. Um, we, you know, don't have enough women. You talked about the distribution of, you know, where they may be in Hampton, there's, you know, four and there be there may be sites that um, don't have any. The assignments um, are highly variable. I mean, each VA may have this person assigned to a PAC team or they may be um, embedded in a mental health program. Um, it, would, it would be great to be able to have um, you know, at least one peer support individual in mental health, but, you know, each facility is different, but I I cannot uh, disagree with you. Um, You can't uh, say enough good things about having female support, peer support veterans as part of a 
multidisciplinary comprehensive mental health staffing program. Well, thank you. And, and I was going to follow up uh, specifically because I know that OPM has um, re relaxed some of the, the hiring requirements and the VA has been able to very rapidly hire a large number of people. Is the peer support specialist um, a specific area where they've improved on the number of, um, of those available? Um, is there a high vacancy rate in that particular position or um, is there anything more that we should do or look at as a committee? Because this seems to unanimously be something that everyone is agreeing is, is a very effective means to, to reach veterans and especially helpful for female veterans. It may be effective if we get back to you on the record for where we are looking at peer supports and the issues of vacancies and what positions are actually designated as peer support positions. Okay, thank you. And just in the last few seconds, Ms. Bartlett, um, you know, I was curious if you had any suggestions uh, with the peer support program um, that would you know, make that more effective or any feedback that you have from female veterans about this program? I think uh, Dr. Hayes and Dr. McCutcheon had mentioned exactly what I was thinking. Um, there needs to be a better definition of standardized qualifications for these individuals. Um, and their performance goals, performance duties, and the outcomes between them and their managers. Um, it, it needs to have a, a guideline, and uh, that way it can be measured in the outcome. Okay. Well, thank you all for your feedback on this, and would love to follow up the conversation to get more in-depth information about this, and if there's something moving forward that the, the committee should do specifically to focus on um, not only improving the numbers, but also the quality um, of of care and guidelines for, for these professionals um, helping our women veterans. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Loria. And um, um, I think we have, um, everyone has had an opportunity uh, to ask uh, some questions. And um, certainly if anyone else has additional questions, um, we've still got a little bit of time. We, could, we can do that if other members, I think, you know, I think all members are multitasking at this particular point, but I know there are a few members that are still um, uh, with us. So, um, and I, I, before we end, I did have um, um, a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. They're short ones. Um, and um, Dr. Hayes, this is uh, really for you and that there was a, um, uh, you know, an OIG report, it was a 2012 OIG report. So it's been, you know, it's been actually quite a while. Um, and the report was really um, focused on, um, you know, some of the challenges the VA was having with regards to um, out of state and patient uh, programs, so forth and so on. Um, I, I'm not asking so much about the report right now, but um, our staff has been uh, trying to find on the VA website a central location for all of the programs, uh, and particularly mental health programs, that are offered sort of exclusively to women. Um, and staff has come back and said to me that the only place where they can find um, all, all of the programs uh, uh, in one place uh, for women is in this OIG report from 2012. So, you know, I just want you to take that home. Um, and uh, you know, this is a constant frustration for me that we have, you know, we have a lot of good information on that website, but sometimes it is so difficult uh, to get through, you know, four or five different portals before you find the information that you're looking for. And it just seems to me that we should make it a lot easier so that um, uh, it's so that it's much more user friendly. So if you'll just you know uh, take that back with you, I would appreciate it, and hopefully we can fix that. Um, it's a, a a simple problem with a simple solution. So the other thing too is um, I had the opportunity before um, uh, COVID nineteen. Um, was to go to Boston and visit uh, some of the programs that were uh, there for women. With, and there's just some incredible programs going on in Boston. Um, I just wish we could replicate Boston um, all the way across the country and we would have the very best VA uh, exercising best practices uh, across the country without question. But still there was this issue about, uh, this issue still c continues about um, not the VA not wanting to send women from South Carolina to a program in Boston. 
Um, and uh, we certainly saw the program in Boston, in Boston and certainly talked to women um, who have been treated in Boston and said, you know, it, it changed their lives. And many of them were from out of town. They figured out their family situation so that they could be there. And they know they knew they knew that they needed to be there. Um, and so, you know, I hope that we can begin to. Um, First of all, for physicians across the VA to know more about these programs so that they can refer women veterans when they need it. Um, but secondarily, that um, you know, there are only there are not that many programs across the country, and that we should be able to make those referrals and and women come from out of state. So I guess I'm asking you to take that home uh, uh, with you as well. And um, I think before we uh, end, um, uh, I, if uh, Dr. Dunn um, or Ms. Luria, if, or Dr. Rowe, if you have any more, uh, any further questions you'd like to ask? No, no further questions. I, I um, had a couple of quick closing remarks when you're ready for that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rowe, Ms. Luria, everybody good? No further questions, thanks. Okay, okay, great. Well, uh, thank you all for being here. This has been, uh, you know, another productive, um, another productive uh, task force meeting and uh, ha having uh, so, so many, as I said earlier, strong women uh, so dedicated to the welfare of women veterans uh, is really, really uh, incredible. But there's no question that uh, based on the discussion that we have to, um, uh, we cannot lose sight uh, of women veterans and their mental health needs. Uh, uh, women veterans uh, have earned and deserve uh, the right uh, uh, to have a healthy environment in the military when they serve and to have a healthy environment in the, in the civilian life uh, when they return. So we have to, uh, you know, continue really to work on that. And also, um, uh, we, we didn't hit upon this subject as, as much uh, uh, today, but uh, again, with regards to, to, to mental health, we've got to make sure that the VA continues to uh, adapt to sort of rapidly changing, the rapidly changing face of women veterans, because uh, uh, while it is the largest cohort, we're also, what also is growing is that there are more uh, women veterans of color, uh, more LGBTQ uh, women, and we need to be uh, uh, sensitive uh, uh, to, 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 those, um, to those issues and those cultures, and that's uh, 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 cultural competency is very, very important. So, and uh, it's really nice to have the VA and the, uh, uh, the folks uh, with regards to research here, and I think, uh, you know, one thing that the VA does really, really well um, is research. Uh, what we're still working on very hard is taking that, translating that research um, into high quality programs throughout the VA. We tend to do the research. We tend to have a couple of good programs that come out of the research, uh, but then we don't scale it. Uh, that's a, a, a constant, you know, I think a constant theme and a, and a constant challenge. And certainly uh, within the Deborah Sampson Act, we really tried to um, react to uh, the VA and in terms of making a greater investment uh, uh, for women veterans, since it's the largest uh, the largest growing cohort, uh, we need to make a larger investment uh, for their overall health care, both their physical and and, uh, and, and mental health care. So we will, uh, you know, continue uh, continue to work uh, on all of that. But it's. Um, you know, it's uh, this issue about uh, peer support, uh, this issue around isolation, this issue around uh, how magical it is uh, to provide uh, connections uh, uh, for, for women veterans because those connections don't naturally exist like they do for, for male veterans. And I, you know, before COVID, I had the distinct pleasure of traveling across the country and talking to incredible uh, women, uh, women serving in the military and women uh, veterans. Um, and it's amazing just talking to them. Each, each time I would speak to a, a group of people, whether it was in Boston or San Diego, 
at first, uh, you know, it was a little hard to get the women veterans to kind of open up uh, and, and share uh, some of their issues and, and or concerns. But as soon as I started talking about, well, I talked to other women and they said X and they said Y. And then suddenly this group just opens up and there's never enough time because they so appreciate being seen, being heard, um, and being around and, and, and being with other uh, women. And veterans, and that that is so critical. And I've witnessed the, a, a, an un, incredible program woven uh, that I saw in Boston, and then uh, saw them again in action in in San Diego. It's just uh, an extraordinary program. And the but the magic about woven is is again. Uh, connecting uh, women veterans and, and scaling. Because what they do is they, they train women veterans uh, and so they can go back to their communities and begin to connect uh, 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 women veterans. And, and there's something magical about that. And there's something that, uh, you know, when we talk about resources, it seems like it's something that doesn't really cost a lot. It is, a, it is really about just... Uh, being uh, razor focused on making sure that that's happening community by community by community. So again, I want to thank um, I want to thank every everyone for attending. And Dr. Dunn, if you have any closing comments, your time is now. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Brownlee. I just want to say that you know there's never been more women in the active duty reserve and guards, and so we can expect to see ever increasing numbers of women taking advantage of the Veterans Administration system, uh, the health system, and all of its uh, Unfortunately, as we've heard today, you know, women still face uh, some particular hurdles, uh, barriers to care within the VA, and I'm concerned about that. I'm also concerned about how the pandemic and the quarantine is affecting everybody in the nation, and certainly our veterans as well. Uh, you know, the, the, the isolation does cause stress. It is a form of isolation. And I think that we need to stay laser focused on, on doing everything that we can for, for everybody with that. And then with that, I also want to thank the panelists who came and, uh, and spent their time with us today. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to inform us. And uh, with that, Chairwoman Brownlee, I yield back. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Don. And uh, before we close, uh, May is Mental Health uh, Month. Every month should be Mental Health Month, particularly during this COVID pandemic. But for the veterans who still may be listening, I just uh, once again want to provide the number for the Veterans Crisis Line, and that number is 1-800-273-8255. All you need to do is press 1, and it'll be connected uh, to a qualified responder who's there 24-7. Um, and if you don't want to call the 800 number, you can also text at 838-255. Um, and with that, I, again, I thank all of you for participating uh, in, in today's um, roundtable task force. We appreciate it very much. I hope that we are um, together in real life uh, soon, um, but this has been very, very helpful. And, and with that, we'll adjourn. Thank you so much. Thank you.